is the worst form of violation that any human being can meet out to another and so it is it is not something that even in this age and time it's not something that we should be talking about it should have been one of the things that we would say oh in our dark dark past this used to happen but unfortunately it is something that we still have to deal with and um, let us note that the majority of people who get sexually abused are abused by people they know, people they thought they could trust. So like all the experts said, perpetrators are people who are familiar to their victims. These victims will trust them, and yet they abuse them. He was somebody I knew. He was somebody who, was, who had expressed interest in me. He was somebody that I was in the same group with. So somebody I see often. And so he, he the person involved was my course mates at the same time we were in the same church so we became friends so sometimes after class he would come to my place for us to study together my uncle from my mother's he came to he told my mom that i should accompany him to a funeral to his uncle's funeral. First, she told my mom that my mom should accompany him. My mom gave birth fresh, so he, she was not able to go. My uncle told my mom. When the innocent innocently runs into the arms of the wicked, in no sense, they are weakened. They are beaten. They are broken. The surprising thing is that most of these victims will not even run away. They will not resist. That is what we talk about today. Tonic immobility. It's something, tonic immobility is something that a lot of people don't know about. Um, those that know about it link it to animal, the animal kingdom. But we forget that human beings are elevated forms of animals, right? And so what happens there also happens to us. It looks like it is something that enables perpetrators because then it paralyzes the, the victim in, in some ways. And it's even one of the reasons why some, sometimes the stories don't add up. When we are faced with challenges, and this happens to all of us, you go into a mode where you assess what is going on around you. And then that informs the rest of you or your body what actions to take. You may either realize that this is something that you can fight. And so your, your, your system gives the instruction. You are invigorated and you fight this person. You may realize, I can't fight this, but I can run. And so, again, you are invigorated to run. But sometimes, you, you are in a state where you know you can't do either or. And the mind tries to protect you. Makes you feel nothing, sort of. So you may go into this frozen mode where you can't do anything because you recognize that this predator is going to empower you either way and that is a difficult state to go in 
So you just freeze and go into a state where we call tonic immobility. You are unable to move. So you can't defend yourself in any way at all. Um, you can't even shout. I see my mind was frozen. I couldn't think of any any way to, I, I couldn't think of any way to 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 get out. And I, after this, I was asking myself, but in any case, the door was not locked. So why didn't I just get up and run? Our but all at that point, I just felt I was even I was frozen. I was I was just in shock. I was and he took off his clothes. At that point, I realized that I, I, I felt trapped. I felt trapped. I felt I was in, I was surprised. I was shocked. The other somebody, like somebody I knew, like really. And I, I felt trapped because I felt I had, I had left off, I had left news of my guy, if I should put it that way. I have. I had taken a reasonable risk and I didn't know what to do or I had just figured out uh, if I should do it. My, my mind was, I, I could not think of anything and I saw my hands shaking and I couldn't say anything. I, I was, After he had had his way, I think I was still shaking. I was, I was still, I was still shaking. I, I, I was, I felt I was living outside my body. Like I was, I, I, I couldn't feel me. I, I couldn't, like, I, I couldn't feel I was in touch with my, I, I thought I was. So I went to the balcony to be there for a while, thinking that when he sees the reaction, he would leave. So I stayed in, at the balcony for, I think a little above an hour. Then I came back to the room. When I came back to the room, I realized that he was naked. So I passed out and I could feel that um, he was touching me. He took off my clothes, everything. But I just, I could, I could sense everything that was happening, but I, I just couldn't move or do anything. When I opened my eyes, he was gone and... It isn't voluntary. This is an involuntary state that the person goes in. And there are messages that are sent from the brain to the body. There are chemicals and hormones that are thrown about. And when these happen, it just makes the person's thinking go a bit irrational and they would are uh, unable to do what we would say normally react or respond to, unfortunately. Now, it has been shown clearly that those who go into the state are many more than those who are able to fight and run. And unfortunately, when this happens, Part of the changes that happen is that they are unable to recall. So they may give you a story that is, in, is a bit fragmented. This doesn't mean that they are lying about what they are saying. It simply is part of that reaction that they've gone through. And so their story may not add up to you, but that's because they themselves are very confused. They have been unable to follow exactly how things happen. When things were happening, they were in a frozen state. And so they are as unsure about what exactly happened as you are to some extent. We can now notice the inconsistencies in one of the victims. She promises her perpetrator that she will report. Yet this same person goes to the mother and lies about it until she was caught. Mm-hmm.
This unfortunate state that victims find themselves will always impede the process of justice for them. For it is not enough for a judge or a jury to believe that somebody is probably guilty. Proof beyond reasonable doubt is the game. Yes, so you cannot recall anything and you still feel ripped or defiled. And you are before me. I realize as a lawyer my evidence to prosecute this agenda or to give you counsel because there, we know very well that if it's a criminal matter, the state will get to a lawyer. So let me put myself in the shoes of a state attorney. And you are unable to give the evidence to help support prosecution. What I will say to this young lady, to this woman, to this little girl, is that it is tough, but the reason why the law is made the way it is is that there's a general principle that it is better to allow 99 criminals to go scot-free than to imprison one innocent person. And when you are the victim, this principle will sound absurd. But when you are an innocent person and you are being imprisoned for something you have not done, you see how praiseworthy such a principle is. So it will be a difficult situation, but I must say that all is not lost. Even when you are unable to prove your case and get this person behind bars and maybe convicted and sentenced, I will advise you that and even somebody who is watching and may fall a victim of rape or defilement. A victim already, kindly don't carry this thing to heart. Don't overstretch it. Learn to let things go. Seek advice from counselors or a counselor you really trust. You may need medical advice as well. As if the impediment to justice is not enough. Most often than not, even loved ones do not believe in them. They don't believe the stories they tell. They feel they are thicker. And it hurts them the more they feel isolated. So the first person I told was the a close friend and the person's response was 
we all go through things that we didn't anticipate. But what has happened has happened. I should rather look on. But the second person I told was rather disappointed in me and that broke my heart. The person held me in so much high esteem. The person was so disappointed that I could rather do this to myself. And I was, I, I mean, that even hurt me. So when I hear a child say that uh, even my mom did not believe me, uh, it's disappointing because we are supposed to be, parents are supposed to be the first point of call for, for the children. So if even the mom or dad refuse to, <laughs> I mean, they refuse to, to, to believe what the child is saying, then it means we are naturally pushing the children out there and they were confining their friends and their friends cannot give any better advice or help and, and at that point it, it hurts me more than even the rip because i was very i, I thought i was co i was confiding in somebody so i said that i even asked for resources to seek medical attention the person said no and and i, I was I, I was sad but it's a, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell anybody. So it was a friend that approached me. I realized that people at church and were acting very strange towards me. So it was a friend that approached me and said that he he heard that I forced myself onto one of our members and the person slept with me. When I heard that, it hit me very hard, so I passed out. Then the guy asked me that, he's, he's been my friend for a while and he knows that I'm not that kind of girl, so what exactly happened? So I narrated the story to him and he said we should report it. So we reported to the pastor and some few members, but, well, I, I don't think they believe. So let's try and give an attention to what our children say. And then the teachers, we are the next point of call. Let's try and also make some time, at least find out more from the child and then we'll be making a headway. mental health impact of being sexually assaulted are many and so we need to take this crime seriously it's not that the rape is over so you should be able to get on with life it doesn't happen many victims would go into a deep depression um, and sometimes it may not be uh, recognized for what it is they may get very anxious and afraid. And when I was cleaning up, I saw the I saw my blood, and that made me cry. And all I said was, "You have hurt me. Like you have, you have, you have not just physically hurt me, but you have you have taken something very dear from me." And, and that was the last thing I said. I didn't utter any word again. Worst of all, you may develop post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a situation where the person is virtually living on edge. You may see something, hear something, even smell something that reminds you of that particular day. And you are set back right to that day when this happened. And so you keep having recurrent episodes of this terrible feeling. You are on hyper alert and on edge 
anytime any of these triggers comes your way, your sleep pattern is affected, you may be getting somatic symptoms, you can't sleep, you're, you're getting headaches, and so on and so forth. It isn't a, a, a pleasant feeling to have. So I didn't feel any pain on that day. I didn't feel anything. But the next day was when I felt the sharp pains in my groin. And I couldn't walk. It was so painful walking. It was, it was, it wasn't the next day that I, I felt that I, I felt pains in my body. This delayed pain sounded unbelievable. But Dr. Erica Dixon explains. So sometimes the victim in that state of shock and being frozen um, gets so automated they are able to move about and do a few things before it dawns on them what has actually happened with them. And um, it's difficult for the lay person to have a clear understanding of this. But what happens is that that rush of chemicals and hormones that are thrown about in the blood causes some numbing, you know, some kind of pain, um, pain quenching hormones are thrown in there. And so this person is totally numbed, cannot even feel the pain, and they just go into an automated mood as part of the tonic immobility. It is much later when this reaction simmers down that the normal reactions that they would have had now comes to the fore. And this is why some people's response may not seem um, in quote normal to others. That that response does not seem like the usual flight and fight uh, response that people get but it is also a very valid response or reaction to sexual assault. It's, um, somebody who has been victimized challenged in fighting such situations, unfortunately. So we realize that a person who has been sexually abused is more likely to be abused again and again because they lose that ability and each time the senses are provoked or the triggers provoke these feelings, they go into that tonic immobility state. And so they, 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 they are frozen, they can't respond, and people take advantage of them again and again. But the woman will go through a series of things of what did she do, what, how did she react, and the stigma that will go with it. When I, I grew up in a neighborhood where it was a very common thing that, oh, this, this girl has been defiled by so, so, and so. And every time the girl is walking around, it's like, this is, the, this is the girl that was defiled. So you don't want that to follow you. Now the pain, the disappointment, the rejection, the unbelievable stories. One person, the victim, is going through all these. My question then is, how do they move on? What should they do? All is not lost. Even when you are unable to prove your case and get this person behind bars and maybe convicted and sentenced, I will advise you that and even somebody who is watching and may fall a victim of rape or defilement. A victim already, kindly don't carry this thing to heart. Don't overstretch it. Learn to let things go. Seek advice from counselors or a counselor you really trust. Okay. So what I want to say to victims is that when it happens, just at least find someone that you trust to open up to, someone who would understand you and maybe someone who would lead you to report so that you get... You may need 
medical advice as well the situation might be bad a situation where let's say you are raped by not men gang rape as they put it you may need medical advice not just counseling from a professional counselor emphasis on professional counselor it is not a time to say i'm going to speak to my pastor he is your pastor but might not have the professionalism to coach you it is important that for anyone who has been sexually abused that your first point of call be a hospital as happens in any hospital the doctor would want to find out what the problem is with you feel free to let them know what actually has happened with you with that information they would now examine you i know that gynecological examination can be uncomfortable for most people but it is the examination in that moment that can make a huge difference especially if you intend to follow through with charging the person with the crime that they have committed it will be it can be tested for dna where it is required and then they would give you some treatment of course where it's been a violent assault pain has to be managed some antibiotics may be given and especially the prophylaxis of hiv is this is essential now to all my victims i dedicate this video to you you will find justice one day you will be healed one day but remember the stress the anxiety the fear the anger the trauma can cause intense difficulty in feelings but the surest way out is to talk about it they call it catharsis may you find justice and healing and i want to also talk to survivors of of all forms of violation it is not easy sometimes you doubt yourself sometimes you are asking could i have enabled it could i have encouraged it it is not your fault it is never anybody's fault that they get violated and so please when you are violated talk about it it is when you talk about it that others will also find their voice. So don't keep it to yourself. Don't say you are going to end it all. We are here to support you. We are here to help you heal. It happened to you. You didn't invite it onto yourself. So if you are violated in any way or any form, it doesn't matter that it happened 20 years ago or it happened today. Talk about it seek help help is waiting for you